So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. We welcome you all to this session, which unfortunately we tried to do two weeks ago, but uh, uh, we thank you all for your understanding of the technical glitch. So it gives me great pleasure to welcome a colleague, Dr. Asaf Schelling, who's Assistant Professor of Musicology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, an award-winning author, talking about his new book, Theological Stains, Art, Music, and the Zionist Project, published by Oxford University Press in 2020, along with Dr. Malcolm Miller, musicologist and pianist, associate lecturer at Open University in the UK, and lecturer at the City Literary Institute in Morley College. So I will turn things over to Asaf and Malcolm. Welcome. Um. Well, uh, I'd like to say welcome to everybody and uh, especially to our staff and thank you for the introduction to Mark. Um, I would like to start just by really just introducing Asaf also um, uh, myself um, after Mark's introduction. Um, just to say um, that uh, we are um, we are discussing um, Asaf's second book, um, and um, just to say that about the first book, which we, which presume might come might come up in our discussion, Jewish Contributions and the Soundtrack of Israeli History, was published in 2014 already, and I, I believe is probably one of the first sort of general overview uh, books of um, Israeli music in in the recent uh, decades, and won uh, many awards. Um, and uh, what we're going to be discussing is his second book, um, as Mark said, just published, um, which, as, as it says on the cover, traces the growth of art music in Israel from the mid 20th century to the turn of the 21st. In other words, it's very up to date. Um, and um, we'll discuss what the title um, focuses on in a minute, but there are four main chapters, which um, that I've just outlined here which um, outlined the sort of the, the general trend of the book, which we'll, we'll be looking at. Um, and we will also be um, looking at some uh, musical examples and they, the, the, the links which I'm showing here will have been sent earlier on and can be found on the um, Snowingly, it's, is the title of the uh, YouTube channel, uh, which Asaf has created to illustrate all the works in the in the book. And in fact, that that brings me to my my introduction because one of the things that one um, knows about Israeli music perhaps is that it is, isn't well known. Um, if you go into concert halls around the world, you know it it is quite a a special occasion when you have a, a work by a composer from Israel. Um, it has to be said that the Israel Philharmonic, perhaps when they, they do their tours, are not known necessarily for performing them in, the, in abundance. Um, but uh, we do find um, some pockets of, of uh, Israeli music performed. And I've actually got the privilege with Geraldine being here of having organized some of the London performances in the past when we were uh, from the JMI Forum doing um, Israeli Music Days at the South Bank. And that was a, was a great experience, actually, to hear the variety and the sheer sort of uh, imagination coming from all the different age groups of composers. We had Svi Avni's uh, Primo Levi songs, and we had um, some, some Menachem Sur, and we had uh, some of the younger Leo Navok premieres, etc. And uh, so... One of the things one has to say about this topic is that it's it's certainly not boring. It's full of interest. It's full of richness. It's full of variety. Um, now, Asaf has written a book um, on which covers sort of a lot a lot of music. Um, there have been books on on Israeli music, but they tend to have been either sort of very general chapters in broader histories, or um, which tend to be therefore you know. Um, I wouldn't say superficial, but they, they're sort of uh, brief, let's say concise in their comments. And there have been monographs on individual composers. Johann Hirschberg, we're very privileged to have here, who's written the English, for probably the first English monograph on Israeli composer on Ben Chaim. We've had in, since then other monographs. There's their are books about Tal, about Mark Kopitman, and about um, uh, various other 
composers, but not one which really attempts to somehow synthesize uh, the the trend in a in a in a larger way, and also in an extremely thought provoking, and I would uh, I say even polemical way. Um, but to ruffle a few feathers is always a good thing, and I think maybe there's been quite a few feathers being ruffled <laughs> in the over these in these books. So I hope we'll ruffle a few more this afternoon. Um, what I'd like to say is introducing the topic of Israeli music in general brings me to think about the, the general question of nationalism. It has to be said, most writing on Israeli music always starts with that sort of thing. Well, what, but I, I won't be an exception. What do we say, what, what do we, in, when we're writing about British music, you know, what is, what is British music? What is American music? Um, what is Russian music? Taraskin might like to um, answer that one. Um, and I, I mean, recently I've been looking at uh, Scottish music and the variety of things that you could say are Scottish music, the old folk songs that Beethoven set in the 18th century or uh, a, a revivalist uh, ba folk band now using, using a variety of maybe Scottish but also Middle Eastern instruments in the band, um, a, a piece by James Macmillan, which is a very reflective post -to a sort of tonal minimalist style work or um, a work by say Judith Weir who's the master of the Queen's music at the moment um, and is a Scottish composer and has written an opera of the Vanishing Bridegroom where they they're sort of uh, um, contemporary versions of ancient legendary walking songs and folk songs and fiddling and Maxwell Davis of course Peter Maxwell Davis who isn't Scottish but wrote a lot of music for Orkney and uses Scottish so so can we then say, oh yeah, this is a Scottish style? I don't, I don't think that answer is very easy. But what I think comes out of that is that all those works uh, pertain to the as whatever the composer thinks of as being Scottish means to that composer, but also the experience of Scotland in some way. Um, but are we trying to homogenize it into some sort of theory? And I think that's the danger in sometimes looking at nationalist schools that we want to say, well, this is what we call Israeli music, or this is what we call Scottish music because it uses this tune, these sort of tunes or these Scotch snaps or this thing. And th these sort of markers of, of, uh, of um, identity uh, are, are problematic. And I think the literature now has reflected that problematic aspect of defining nationalism. And I think Asaf is, is one, of the, one of the thinkers who's really done a huge amount to sort of get inside that whole argument and sort of ask those, those sort of questions. What is, what do we mean by Israeliness, uh, or rather what were, the, what were the problems, let's say, or the issues confronting the composer in Israel at different times? The other little, um, I'll say the, I think which I'd like maybe he will pick up on is this the concept of what Israeli music is over the years. It, it's always associated with East West in some way. Um, the encounter of the the East, the synthesis of the East and West. This this sort of thing has become perhaps one of the um, formulaic type of definitions of something to do with Israeli music. Does it does it hold? Does it hold water? That's one of the questions I'd like maybe Asaf to, to discuss um, now, but also the way in which that is played out within the larger question of contemporary music styles is, is what we're really looking at. And um, it, it might be sort of fatu uh, fatuous just to sort of talk about it in such general terms, but to see specific examples of how these things are dealt with. Um, it's been um, one of the um, good, um, uh, fortunate uh, things in leading up to this debate that I've actually had a few discussions with myself, and I know he's full of ideas, so I'm not going to say any more, and I'm just going to throw the, 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 the floor open to him. Would you like to um, deal with my initial question, which is, what is Israeli music? And is that a question? Yeah. <laughs> is this a question? Uh That's the pipe. Right. Um, let me start by thanking the powers that be for arranging this meeting for the second time. And, and to you personally for reading the book. Uh, it's a chubby one, so uh, you've, you've went through a lot. Um, I want to say a quick comment on the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra, with whom I worked this winter 
uh, I was uh, their curator for uh, Chamber Music Project, which will be posted to YouTube, I'm assuming towards the Chagim, towards Rosh Hashanah. Um, so their repertoire is changing uh, as we speak. And in fact, they took three pieces out of the 13 pieces we've uh, worked on and filmed, and I have some mini lectures in between, and they're gonna tour with that for the first time, rather than doing the exotic fig leaf, which is uh, Ben Chaim's second movement from his first symphony, which was the usual um, uh, checkbox for them to, to say, this is the common, this is the exotic common denominator that is both European, uh, euphonic, and it comes from Israel. So here you go. So it's changing right now. And uh, so this is just to, uh, to comment on the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. And uh, uh, the fact is that when Geraldine and I set this meeting, I was hoping to talk about this series, but I'll guess we, I, uh, I'm guessing we can do that after the Chagim. Um, now, um, what is Israeli music? Uh, I can answer with a question saying, what is Jewish music? And it won't get us anywhere. Um, because usually when someone asks like a, a question like that, I'm, I'm, I want to know who is asking and why. Now, since I know you all too well, I won't ask that, but uh, you know, there is a strange moment in the 30s and 40s of the 20th century when two parties are asking this same question. Uh, and it comes out in the form of either books like uh, Musicians of the Wandering Race, right, by, by Saleski, and it comes out in 1940 in the form of a lexicon der Juden and der Musik, right? Both philosemites, philosemites and anti-Semites are asking the same question because they're interested in promoting difference and promoting otherness. So we have to, we always have to ask who is asking this question and why? Because the very notion of, of taking this adjective Israeli is already, uh, is, is already uh, um, essentialist in the sense that we, we uh, establish the fact that everything that comes from Israel is Israeli. And that's a problem. You know, I came from a contemporary music festival uh, last week in Tel Aviv, and there were works by mostly European contemporary composer, uh, composers. And I think the oldest piece in the repertoire was from 2001. And, and the people working on, on uh, the people uh, writing music in Israel, the last thing they have on their mind is adjectives like Israeli or nationalism. So uh, we, we, may, we may be assuming too much when we think about, about nationalism being uh, at the forefront of composers' aesthetic preferences. Some of them knew uh, what they had to do in order to ring the bells and whistles of the Zionist project, um, and, and they negotiated a compromise that wouldn't, that wouldn't uh, um, uh, change your styles in a way that they couldn't live with or couldn't present their works um, the way they had done before immigrating to Israel. Um, I'm thinking of a person like Ben Chaim, uh, whose letters from World War I, I, I read uh, with great interest because the last thing on his mind is nationalism, neither German nationalism and later nor Israeli nationalism. Uh, he was, his perception of, of, uh, of uh, his place in, in the nation was a sense of civic uh, as, sorry, a cultural uh, a citizenship. And that's how he perceived his music. And he, um, he issued those easy nationalist formulations. And that's why he negotiated a compromise while writing music that could, um, could uh, both uh, project or at least compete uh, with the uh, European centers or compete for attentions in the European centers and, and send enough signals domestically to be part of the discourse. Would we consider that nationalism? I don't know. Um, but he was, he suspected this whole idea of nationalism. So we might be uh, crowning him uh, prematurely without, without checking, without checking uh, the, uh, his perception, which, which we can trace through his music for first, but also through his letters, through his diaries, through his Gedichte in rhyme form, these these, uh, um, uh, these wonderful poems he'd written in the 60s and 70s that are extremely cynical and they betray this unknown autobiography stripped off any nationalism or, or national um, um, attributes. Well, okay, so 
Thank you so much. I mean, you've, you've got us on to, to Ben Chaim, which is a good place to start. Um, it's interesting that you say that, of course. I mean, I did actually um, uh, think of the way that you're, you obviously describe Ben Chaim in a certain way in the book. And, I, um, and one of the ways is that you do, I thought, find him um, very much on the conforming to political correctness, as it were, of the time, and trying to, um, what you what you call the redemptive allegory, ad adhering to what's called the redemptive allegory in your, in your terminology. Um, and um, although you don't say it, uh, the sort of the word statist, in, you know, I don't think in relation to him, but, but that he's, that he is, um, that he's part of the, the, the idea, the nationalist um, attitude of the time. So, so the question that I would say is, to what extent was, I mean, the, obviously he had a self-conscious, I mean, he had an awareness of what he was doing in, in his, uh, let's say, um, his activities, I mean, were, which, which were to get, especially with Baruch HaTzfira, learning the, learning the music of, of the Oriental Jews or, or and um, writing arrangements and using using materials, I suppose, in a Bartokian sort of way, absorbing certain elements of the Middle East, the things that we sort of point to. He was aware of that process as being conforming to some general, something that was going on, let's say, in the culture, in the society, in the culture. So I want to say, to what extent is the is this Nash, this redemptive allegory or the or the sort of nationalism coming from the individual artist, and to what extent is it coming from some above? Is there a myth? Is there an above uh, through which the ideology is coming, or is it really just coming from the agents themselves? And who are the agents? Is in this in this negotiation of that of the ideology of the aesthetics? Right. Uh, it's usually a network. I mean, he was uh, familiar, or he was exposed enough to the to the manner by which Zionist had read the Bible in, in a literal manner, stripped off all of its post-biblical um, uh, texts and commentaries. They wanted the, uh, the dry, uh, immediate text that served them politically. And uh, Ben Chaim realized that, that when he wrote The Vision of a Prophet, for example, that just setting um, Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones would be symbolic enough. He wouldn't have to invest additional uh, markers to, to uh, become part of the discourse. And this was a, a, a useful leeway for him because uh, he could write in the same euphonic manner that characterized them, always very meticulously and, uh, orchestrated and the craftsmanship is always remarkable. But uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't pushing it too much, neither to the modernist side with which he had been extremely suspicious uh, and nor uh, nor towards um, uh, overt nationalism in the form of um, citations that would again uh, change this balance uh, in his writing. So in this way, he could cater both to to Europe. He could continue uh, writing music, and it's not a coincidence that uh, when Bernstein uh, performed with his Sweet Psalmist of Israel. Uh, in the 50s, he chose this piece because he recognized the same balance. Uh, he wouldn't take Tal, for example, because Tal uh, might have been um, might have been uh, pushing the envelope too far uh, with his post-tonal formulations. Although Tal was as attentive to this same discourse as Ben Chaim, but the means through which he projected that were completely different, uh, of course. Um, so um, Ben Chaim was actually looking for this balance that uh, would allow him to write the same way he had written uh, in the 30s and 40s. Of course, with, with the uh, necessary dialectics that is part of every composer's uh, uh, development, but without committing himself too much. But, but at some point, the piece I mentioned earlier, The Vision of a Prophet, was written in the late 50s. So at one point, um, the balance changes because the, the way he writes in the late 50s and early 60s uh, is uh, this 
this euphonic sound sounds more like a summary of what the yeshuv had sounded like as far as art music is concerned in the late in the 30s and 40s and not anything like uh what was happening with both emigrant and young native composers writing music in the late 50s and 60s so at one point i think uh and you can see the decline in his output after the, after the early 60s at one point uh he he sounds and I know this might upset Joachim Hirschberg, but it, it, it might, at one point he sounds obsolete to the people who are uh, um, uh, dealing with um, all those ethnic ethnographic imports that, um, again, several composers are, are, are grappling with that, uh, realizing that they cannot uh, uh, tame those ethnographic imports by tonal means anymore. They have to write according to their um, uh, linear properties, namely their melodic properties, their textural properties, and their and their uh, horizontal harmonic qualities. And that changes everything because instead of of sifting this music through the Eurocentric toolbox, the uh, the equation changes completely. And when that happens in the 50s and 60s, Ben Chaim is not part of this discourse. He becomes very alienated. And, and pushes back every modernist formulation. Of course, the excuse was Stockhausen and Boulez, but they weren't present at all, neither in their aesthetics nor, nor in body. But it was like a symbol of uh, uh, stay away. So, I mean, are you talking about people like Boscovich in his later years and um, perhaps um, um, even Partosh later on, that sort of generation? I mean, Tal, we know, is... Uh, an atonal composer, but it was also who became then uh, very interested in electroacoustic music and was sort of on that path. But at the time, I suppose, as you say, Tal was also, as it were, you, you know, deriving, what he, using folk material and traditional material. Uh, now, you make a distinction, actually, talking about Tal talk, um, in his second piano concerto. You discuss that in a fair bit of length. In fact, one of the lovely things about your book is that it's so full of remarkably detailed analyses of so many pieces. So that's sort of, uh, you know, eye-opening from the start. And plus, you've also expanded my English vocabulary hugely uh, with certain words like autochthonous, which I had no idea existed. Um, but uh, that's um, but the, the way that you've done... Uh, you discuss the tal is that you say that because he's well, I, and this is something maybe Setter also comes into this bracket in this sort of uh, set that he takes uh, a, a, a melody like say Ben Haim might use also in his uh, sort of slow movements let's say um, and um, but discuss it in a sort of uh, motivic um, deconstruction and 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 reconstruction and, and sort of use it in an entirely uh permutations and a, in a sort of eternal fabric is that that seems to me that's that's one strand and the other one is what i meant boxkovich using the sort of the linear middle eastern oriental non-harmonic vision so right are those two things different are they the same are they you know how do they well there are several parameters right. here uh, to begin with i think that tal's post tonality has always been an excuse to, to exclude him from, from this group. But when you, when you check his output uh, and, and, and disregard for a moment his post-tonal formulations, you realize that he was as invested in modern Hebrew poetry and the Bible um, and working with Israeli librettists as much as any other composer. Um, is there a difference in the way he, he, he wrote music? Uh, to a certain extent, because that was his personal style, and, and thank God he he is um, he has this um, uh, unique style that we can talk talk about him without grouping him. You know, there was this ideology of grouping composers according to dates of birth, and the 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 more you know their archive, the more different they they appear to you. And even though even if they were born a year apart, um, or immigrated a, a year one after the other to uh, mandatory Palestine, so. Um, so there are a couple of issues here. First of all, the way composers grappled with, with the ethnographic. Uh, for some, uh, it was enough for them to get, actually, the, there's a part in the book where I, uh, where I deal with um, um, a certain transcription that, as it happens, was transcribed by three composers, Patosh, Ben Chaim, and Setter. 
So they all transcribe the same uh, the same uh, PU, and you can actually follow them. Uh, these these are these are not published works, but you can follow the way they they uh, heard this this piece uh, uh, from from an instrument. These these weren't the same instruments, uh, the same Yemenite PU, and you can follow the way they harmonize it, which means the way they uh, uh, perceive that harmonically. Now with Ben Chaim, it's it's fairly easy to see that every uh, model tweak was always on the veneer, and it was always steered by a tonal framework. With with uh, Setter and and Partosh, this was and they were very different from one another. They always uh, listened to the music. Uh, they listened to the linear harmony embedded within this within this uh, um, monophonic line. And that made everything different because it allowed them, for example, to move from one chord to another, not by, um, not because of a certain harmonic progress, traditional harmonic progression, but rather because of, because of adjacent melodic movement that was animating the harmony. So uh, the very idea of harmony changed without it being tagged as tonal or atonal. It, does, it doesn't really matter because the, uh, the very concept of atonality is so wide that the word in itself is maybe too coarse, right? Too generic even to, uh, uh, to use it uh, as a stylistic marker. So it is very apparent that already in the 50s and, and 60s, composers are, um, the way they, um, break away from, from the grip of tonality and nationalism, which in many ways complement one another, is to, to animate their music according to the uh, um, linear properties embedded in the ethnographic. Now, there is another factor here, and that is the way one encounters this ethnographic import. For some, uh, this was uh, uh, by means of you know, knowing a certain interlocutor and, and transcribing him. For others, this was much more sterile. They would open an anthology and would just pick something out and, and put it on their, on their canvas and deal with it. For others, uh, they actually did the ethnographic field work. A setter, for example, and this is again, something you discover only when you dive into the uh, uh, archive. Setter, for example, in the early 40s, did the field work transcribing the music of, of Corfo Jews, of Greek Jews and Sephardic Jews. Um, and he ended up transcribing almost 120 um, um, melodies, um, encompassing the entire Jewish uh, calendar. And, um, and I'm talking about biblical tropes, uh, dirges, um, 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 piutim of various sorts, uh, music for Shabbat and so forth. Uh, he had enough transcriptions uh, to familiarize himself with the music to the point of being able not only to deconstruct the music, but also to uh, animate and come up with his own melodies based on, on, on what he had been exposed to. So that's a different point of view than just, uh, than just uh, uh, cherry picking a certain, uh, a certain a transcription of someone else. Yeah. Or even... Yeah, no, I, I mean, I see that obviously that we have the sort of example of certain other composers who are also ethnographers like, you know, Be Bela Bartok and Kadai and these people who uh, who then sort of assimilated, you know, um, the, what they'd, they'd found into the music. I mean, so I suppose the, the, the question is the, the, the way that actually that transformation takes place. Um, the way that well, he uses it. So in Midnight Vigil, maybe you want to speak about this piece, uh, Midnight Vigil, which is one of the sort of uh, large scale um, choral um, orchestral pieces of the 50s. Yeah. Uh, was it, uh, is it 50? 61. 61, sorry, <laughs> sorry. Um, where, I mean, the, the way that I, the way that I hear that piece, I, I think it is it's definitely trying. It, it's not a it's not a sort of a modernist construction that comes across. It may well have emanated from it, but there's something very uh, visceral about the sort of the chanting and the and the and the way that the this sort of the modernist framework within the old and the new are sort of combined, if you want, um, in that sort of setting. So it, it, it's not it's not. Um, it's a very perplexing. It's a sort of a very, um, you know, pr 
provoking and emo expressive piece, but there's a sort of tension in there between these these elements, I find. So maybe do you want to just comment on Seta because he had his, on how he uses what you, you're saying. How does he use this material? Right, the, the oratorical version of Midnight Vigil is from 61. There were four other um, um, uh, versions for this piece starting in 57, but we all, we, we're all familiar with the, with the oratorio uh, from, of 61. And the thing is, uh, the attention given to this piece as, as, a, um, as a still image is, a, is may, may be equivalent to the attention given to this very narrow moment in history when Schoenberg consolidates his 12-tone music. Why? Because we tend to decontextualize that, that moment from what happened before and especially after. Because uh, this is really, uh, uh, Midnight Vigil is really uh, an, a, an impressive display of various ethnic traditions, animated, as Setter used to call that in his diaries, animated from within, namely according to their uh, linear harmonic and textural properties. But uh, regardless of his syntactical innovations, he uh, what steers the entire the entire narrative is the same redemptive. Uh, trajectory we identify in so many pieces, including the Zionist historiography, historiography as well, its perception of, its, of the diaspora, uh, its management of Jewish history, and so forth. This idea of, of political theological redemption in the form of the state. For this reason, he consulted a libertist uh, author, Mordechai Tabib, uh, who himself had been uh, had introduced Setter to a variety of uh, of um, um, sources, including uh, uh, Midrashim and Agadot and the Talmud itself, and they constructed this uh, this movement where um, uh, the uh, where its climax was is was supposed to be really a redemptive moment, um, equivalent to to um, uh, to the founding of the state, and and they say that throughout their work together, both Tabib and Setter. Setter was. Uh, um, in parallel, was working uh, on small scales, uh, some sort of a laboratory experiments where he was uh, taking uh, musics or various putim or biblical tropes from his fieldwork and, and trying them out in trios, in quartets, uh, in piano pieces, and trying to animate them and see how they work without, while constantly losing the interest to, to push the ethnographic to the to the forefront, as if, as if, in order to justify his nationalist motivations, he he lost that. And and the after moment is maybe even more interesting because by 1966 he decided not to use any ethnographic imports at all. He perceived them as too marked, which is to say that what started with this uh, um, with his semiotic interest in the in those linear, melodic, and textural properties ended up with him uh, eschewing all those, all those uh, immediate markers and just working with the mechanism itself. Uh, and that's what, that's what gave birth to his symphony from 66 Jerusalem. But when you look at the texts he compiled, the same redemptive trajectory steers the entire, the entire um, um, uh, narrative, so much so that the, the third movement uh, has the choir obsessively shouting the word again and again, geulim, which means the redeemed, right? And you tend to, to you listen to that and you tend to think, is he doubting himself? <laughs> um, is there a problem here? Um, and gradually he would, he would also mute this, uh, he would also mute these uh, theological, political narrative he had that, that inspired his work at least from the 19 the early 1940s so alone a midnight vigil might be misleading that's what i'm trying to say okay yes yeah, so i wanted to talk to you about the um this aspect of the, of the redemptive allegory because i mean i don't know how you know in certain works you where you where you find it sort of uh, heavily present let's say whether it's it's maybe something which can be um, questioned, I don't know, because the, the you know often some aspects, words and words and music can also contradict each other, not any sort of sideline. You know, you can have it's not necessarily a text-based uh, <laughs> um, marker, but it's it's the it's the way that the two interact. So I don't know whether 
you know, as you say, the the doubt, the, the doubting. I mean, that's part of it. You know, there's a sort of ambiguity. Um, maybe, maybe there's anyway. Uh, what I, I think we should, as perhaps we should actually um, discuss um, that in relation to a, an actual piece of music and sort of that that we that we can everybody can hear and we can <laughs> we can discuss. Um, so we've been talk, discussing Tal's atonality and this sort of. Um, the way what's what's interesting is how you sort of perceiving the fact that 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 he was still within um this sort of nationalist uh, um aesthetic or if, if you want i don't think it, I, th I think that's i don't think that's sort of a controversial statement at all but you know the, the what what's probably interesting is is where the where he's pushing out where it's sort of beginning to to move away from it um and and so um I mean, maybe we could discuss also this concept of the biblical trope and the literalism in relation to Tal's um, opera, um, Saul at Ein Dor, which is the one that you, you've written about quite extensively in, in your first chapter of the book. And um, so I mean, in order to maybe to introduce it, we should just listen to the extract, but maybe you wanted to say a few words about We'll, we'll listen to the first, this is for everybody, three minutes, literally, mm. the in, in, introduction up to the first spoken part of this. Uh, and interestingly, um, I have just was looking at this book by Rubin and Barron called Music, uh, Music in Jewish History and Culture. And funny, they list uh, Tal's operas and they don't list this one. Is there a reason for that? Uh, they start with Ashmedai. When was it published? When was it published? Well, recently, very recently. Oh, <laughs> but. Okay. Um, they, they end um, with the recent one. But I'll say just this, this is a good one. I'll say just this. Uh, this is an opera from 1955. Um, it's, it's what Tal called opera concertante, which means no staging uh, uh, dresses or any theatrical presentation. So, and it's not an oratorio because we don't have a, uh, an orchestra um, in the background. So just the protagonist. But what's unique about this opera, and that's in, in direct... Um, in direct follow-up to uh, what we talked about, biblocentrism, the way the Bible uh, was um, was actualized in the Zionist present, is that Tal Tal's libretto uh, or Tal's liberties was the, was not no less than the uh, author of the Book of Samuel. So the uh, the libretto consists of word for word the uh, the text from um, Samuel first chapter twenty eight, the famous story where. Uh, uh, King Saul goes to the ghost wife of Endor uh, to consult her because the uh, the Philistines are camped in Shunem and he's afraid and doesn't know what to do and and he is not he's prevented from any divine knowledge so he has no contact neither with Samuel who had died several chapters ago and uh, nor with nor with God uh, he's completely blocked out and and bear in mind this is a, an interregnum where David has been appointed. Uh, and the feast was anointed in chapter 17, more or less, and he is running for his life. And Shaul is the king de facto, but not the jour, right? And now he's he's seeking ghost, he's seeking advice from the ghost wife, um, and um, and he um, and he um, only to find out that he will uh, die in battle. Right, and, and then we approach the end of Samuel first, and the second one will, will open with the famous uh, 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 lamentation of David over Saul and Jonathan. So this is a this is a very uh, uh, this is an important choice, a text for itself, because Tal chose this chapter, uh, this nocturnal visit to to the ghost wife of Endor, where the king uh, dresses as a common man, and yet she identifies him. There is an interesting part uh, there also. Um, and seeking advice only to discover, only to, to learn about his impending death. And, um, and this turns into a psychological drama, again, um, distance from the great, uh, from those huge fonts of nationalism and the potential of appropriating soul as a, as a national symbol, unlike what, let's say, uh, uh, modern Hebrew poets or authors had done in the 40s. So this is a very smart choice by itself. And I think the, the only, the, the, uh, one of two operas in history that uses word for word the, the biblical text, uh, the other one being uh, Stravinsky's Abraham and Isaac. Right, we will now share screen and um, we'll see everybody back in three minutes around.
Wow. Maybe you can just translate for, for those. Well, it, it's just the beginning of uh, it's just the beginning of uh, uh, this chapter, chapter 28 in, in Samuel first. Um, this is something that the, the author of the book actually repeats in order to set the scene. He's saying, and Samuel had died and he was buried in his, in his city. That's it. It's just the opening. And it's important for the, for the plot because he's uh, King Saul is going to the to the uh, uh, to the ghost wife uh, to bring up uh, Samuel's ghost. So so we have to remind the readers that he had died already, right? He's not uh, he's not part of the scene, in, in, at least not in in, in body. Uh, although he's still very uh, hostile to to uh, Saul and uh, to Saul and um, uh, biblical scholars are saying that. The tension, this tension between priesthood and monarchy is embedded in the fact that uh, is manifested in the fact that the name Shaul nests between Shmuel. <laughs> right? That's good. Um, and also, Samuel was dead. It reminds me of the Christmas Carol by Dickens, which starts, Marley was dead. I mean, it, it, it's, it's sort of, you know, it hits you right at the uh, at the beginning and and it's as you say the words of samuel i mean it's it's, it's he was he's alive you know the words are alive <laughs> so shmuel is right. dead but actually he's there uh could you talk about the musical the musical setting there uh well yeah. this is like a scene setting it's it's, it's really striking the way, you know it's quite interesting it's um, i don't want to you use the word actually when you're talking about ben Hayim being cinematic i don't want to use it in a derogatory way but there is something very 
visual about that this this music you know you just feel it's dark you know and there's there's a there's darkness because he's died but there's also darkness because he's going at night and there's and then you get the flute you know the lovely bright you know suddenly gives you a little flash of light is it a bird flying through you know what is there's sort of uh, it's full of um you know imagination and yet you know we're and we're in this very suspenseful tense musical language as well you know that's sort of offering right. us uh, so um but, but and you talk about that initial motif that thing as, a, as being as a, a, a what do you call it a signal of some sort it's a recurrent periodic signal, signal. Periodic, periodic, signal. periodic signal so what sort of things is you know what what techniques is, is tal using here um to create this sort of ambiance you know just a quick word on on ben chaim's um cinematography um you know in in the um um the vision of a prophet where he sets Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones to music, uh, there are all those uh, common tricks, I'd say, you know, uh, when, the, when, the, uh, when the dead start marching, then you have uh, uh, all those significations, uh, all those topoi that you would be familiar with from late 18th century music, right? They are still in, as, this is still part of the strategy of communications. Certain composers can still use the kudet, uh, or could use back in the 50s. Um, but here it's different because uh, Tal is not interested in signifying um, um, extrovert topoi. Rather, he is more, uh, he's more interested in, interested in uh, um, uh, creating those periodic signals that would steer, uh, that would garner the attention of the listener without them being uh, a sign for, for a specific object or something that is immobile. Uh, and and would therefore limit his range of interpretation. So he would repeat this opening this opening uh, uh, signal, this period that which is why I call it periodic signal. Um, but but then here I had a methodological issue. I could have played the game where I abide by the composite words and say, okay, here is the infant terrible of, of Israeli art music, and and he is the exact opposite of everything else that was tonal. But the very concept of atonality is misleading because tonality is not being negated at any stage in, in uh, 20th century music history. Um, in fact, uh, scholars like uh, um, Ethan Haimo or uh, Jack Boss who deal with, uh, uh, who deal with uh, um, Schoenberg's transition into, uh, um, into um, what they call post-tonal music. Uh, which means the uh, the tonal toolbox is, st is still very much active, only that uh, triadic constructs and maybe those microharmonic scales are absent, but it doesn't mean that tonality as a whole is being negated. So I, I deliberately didn't listen to what Tala was saying about himself, which is which I think uh, uh, pretty much colored his reputation because the words that the uh, the the words that uh, music historians were using in order to characterize his music were not just derogatory or or just uh, uh, negating uh, whatever he lacked compared with other composers. I think that with time, I realized that are, these are just um, the way to measure the distance between what was considered normative and euphonic in the Yeshuv and in the young state. Um, so I did understand, I, I do understand his choice. Of picking something that would uh, that by itself and alone, this psychological drama would be uh, would not lend itself so easily to national commandeering, on the one hand. But in order to understand it, I had to situate the the, the piece uh, both semiotically and to understand the way he was working with uh, cellular harmony. That is to say, with those three chords and tetra chords that were constantly uh, he was constantly. Uh, uh, permutating uh, while he was writing. That's that's why he could he could both uh, repeat those periodic signals, but then uh, but then create lots of variants simultaneously to, uh, for them, in order to adjust himself. And so what he gained with this unbelievable elasticity in writing something that uh, was um, was drawing constantly on motivic development, which is the most traditional uh, um, 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 device you can think of, right? But then he refused those uh, those markers that would uh, limit his range of interpretation, and he did he did this with a chapter with, with a biblical chapter.
that on the one hand was familiar to, to insider, to the Israeli interpretative community, uh, but he did this uh, while choosing something that, um, again, did not lend itself to those big national fonts. Uh, and so it was familiar on the one, the technique was very familiar. Uh, and uh, I think every concert goer, at least the people who saw this opera were familiar with what uh, modern Hebrew poets had been doing with uh, the image of King Saul. They, was using, they were using him as a foil to advance uh, territorial nationalism, Im immigration to the country, um, or even compensating him, right? Because he is the, the not, uh, he's, he's not the, the successful king and everything came and David's reputation eclipsed his. So they wanted to, to rebalance uh, his reputation. Uh, and, and I discussed dozens of, of uh, examples in, in the book. But then there was another element, again, to distance myself from the limited outlook of the composer talking about himself, right? Or the, or, or the vocabulary that was uh, more occupied in negating uh, what uh, Tal had done instead of, instead of looking at what, what the musical canvas offers are, uh, us as a, as a network to work uh, interpreted, interpretatively uh, from the inside out. So, um, so in the book, in order to understand this, uh, this opera, uh, I look at what other composers had been doing uh, with the with the Bible, and Ben Chaim's vision of a prophet is one example. It was written three years after this opera. Um, Chaim Alexander's "Should I Forget You, Jerusalem" for piano variations was, was written in 1947. Um, the Silver Platter by Chaim Alexander from 57 also, um, and even Tal's Suite for Solo Viola from 1940, where you can see his 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 early post-tonal devices when he experiments with that on a single instrument. And this is where he's, he's very exposed because he's working with just one instrument and you can see him practicing periodic signals, practicing uh, uh, his elasticity without, without uh, um, 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 signifying objects, but offering a certain, some sort of potential that is constantly growing and, and moving in and out um, and the great advantage is, is that uh, when you listen to the opera, if you, and if you consult the score, you realize that there is the elasticity is much broader than just uh, a post-tonal uh, cells, but rather he can he can transition from from whole tone to diatonic allusions to post-tonal uh, formulations, and that allows him uh, a huge amount, uh, a huge range of of uh, of uh, um, uh, possibilities in in terms of uh, portraying his characters, their anxieties, their fear, their in, their, their, their lack of um, um, uh, lack of confidence, and and you know having those two individuals meet the, the ghost wife and and Shoal is, is a very charged, uh, intense meeting, and Tal does this, does that wonderfully in in uh, the opera. So it transcends this. This limiting notion, okay, it's atonal, and Tal said that he was in Fon Terrible. Tal was much more national than he wanted to admit because he was working with transcriptions, he was working with modern Hebrew poetry, but he always put that in quotes because he, he knew better. He knew that the same music that, that uh, might be hailed as nationalist was the one that uh, resulted in, in his emigration from Germany. Right. Uh, I, I'm glad you, you brought up the, the, this uh, notion of the operatic characterization. Uh, also that, um, you know, that, I mean, I was wondering, you know, whether on the broader sphere that, you know, the, 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 the use of these things is also there's a sort of a use of light motif in the sense that certain things are associated, they're associative motifs so that, that they sort of characterize and sort of it builds up this and shows what amazing dramatic, dramatic uh, composer he was, you know, that he actually managed to, 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 to bring all these things to bear. I would actually like to discuss this idea of the biblical liter uh, literalism aspect of which you sort of link very closely to, to the Zionism, because I, I think, you know, is it is it necessary to do that? You know, because, for example, um, I remember there was a, an Israeli, was it a theatre production of maybe 10 years ago when they actually did the book of Bereshit on, they put it on stage. It was just literally the sonic 
um, the script of of Braveship, but it was sort of acted. It was very very postmodern and sort of gripping, but it was something. You know, it was very recent. I don't think it had any. It, it was imaginative. It was dealing with the 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 materials. It's almost as if somebody wants to deal with, not with a libretto about something, but they want to they want contact with the materials, like setting the mission, setting the Mishnah or setting the Tam. Suddenly, this Hebrew um, literature becomes tangible, comes close, and you can just use it. Um, you, I mean that, that. I mean, I was thinking of the thrill, let's say, for a composer at the beginning of the state, you know, this sort of young period when there's sort of nothing and sort of everything is possible. And right, why why choose a libretto, you know, do deal with the, the text? Isn't there something about that? You know, the what you're calling literalism is actually the opposite because what they're doing is they're taking the, the text and they're doing something completely other with it, which is obviously here to make an opera, but but it could be it could be other things. Why, why is that? Why is that serving the <laughs> the state? All, well, what I call I Zan, what I call Zan is bibliocentrism. And this yeah. is not my term. It's uh, Jean. Uh, it's uh, uh, um, I'm blanking on his name. Um, wait a minute, uh, Jean Jacques Atias. Uh, Atias is a term. Bibliocentri uh, bibliocentrism. Zan is bibliocentrism means. The selective appropriation of biblical texts that reenacted Hebrew so, uh, sovereignty through the Hebrew language, which is the single surviving linguistic component of ancient uh, Jewish independence. And uh, this selective appropriation conferred directionality to the Zionist project. And literal reading of, of selected biblical texts facilitated uh, a Zionist national allegory that actualized tropes of return tropes of returning, you know, return to the land and re the return of the land, tropes of redemption and territorial expansionism. Think of all, uh, think of uh, uh, Jeremiah's, Isaiah's, or Ezekiel's prophecies. Uh, think even uh, think even of the decree given to Abraham or the exodus from Egypt um, or the uh, feebleness of the uh, uh, generation sentenced to perish in the desert. Um, and you know, I, I think I in the book that uh, the Peel Commission of 1936, during the first stage of the Arab Rebellion, um, um, the um, the um, the Jewish community uh, submitted a memorandum to this to this commission, and they um, they argued the Jewish agency argued that uh, in order to trace the origin of the association of Jewish of the Jewish people uh, with the land of Palestine, they used. Uh, biblical verses from Genesis, from Deuteronomy, from Leviticus. So this was this was an actual uh, this was a, a a living document for Zionists. So this was part and parcel of the discourse. And of course, when modern Hebrew was was emerging as as a linguistic register, the the most immediate register that that proved this uh, this uh, uh, sense of uh, belonging that was part of this ancient. Uh, round of Hebrew sovereignty again. This was the single surviving linguistic component of of, uh, of uh, Jewish independence. Um, it it was it was to be found everywhere in prose, in in poetry, in in modern Hebrew literature, and it was part and parcel of of even uh, several uh, colloquial uh, references in in Hebrew. So this was not something Tal was uh, 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 coming up with with no context or with no. Uh, background, but his choice of, of this psychological drama was a conscious uh, avoidance of those texts that could be appropriated nationally. Yeah, no, I see what you're saying. So there was a context to it. Well, that, I think that's a good actually lead into the next example, which is actually completely different, um, which is the um, Haidu uh, Ludus Pascalis, and I, I know that we've we haven't really got on to beyond Tal at the moment very much, but if we if we jump forward um, into 1970, um, and and we have of course there are many many composers um, who who have you know uh, um, produced an amazing amount of music um, at that time, and actually I, I was going to actually mention Orgad who you've written a lot about in the book and you mentioned the the um, the um, 
the, the violet viola sonata by Tal, and, and you mentioned how ballad, the ballad for viola solo by Orgard is actually sort of so heavily influenced by Tal that he was actually doing, uh, you know, uh, taking on a, a lot of that. And Orgard himself is, is, is fantastic, but we can't, we haven't got time really to discuss everybody, but the, the idea of, maybe you can relate it actually to a little bit to what our God was doing in, in, in sort of reviving or exploring, let's say beneath the surface, certain Jewish traditions. Um, Haidu, who came from originally from Hungary, who, who uh, left in 56 and was in Paris before he, he came eventually to uh, Israel and uh, was uh, perhaps unusual for composers in Israel in that he became very religious, Dati, and he was involved at various stages with Chabad, uh, arranging arranging music for the for the Chabad movement. Um, and he has a, a really interesting um, history of sort of t uh, take on on different types of uh, theological sources. Um, not only not only sort of biblical as we've got here, but I think one of his main really interesting pieces was settings of the Mishnah Mishnayot, and. Um, and this piece, Ludus Pascal, which you discuss, is a fantastic piece of music theatre, which actually combines things that he was very well known for, this sort of understanding of improvisation, which is something that maybe came in that Hungarian uh, group of with Kurtag and um, possibly Ligeti, you know, with this idea of aleatory, um, even a staged type of uh, aleatory improvisation. And... Um, in fact, we we hosted him in in London with his group Kulmus Hanefesh with the with the group that came and performed some of his music. But um, this this piece is really interesting because um, as you as you as you show, it sort of has it's like a collage of of superimposition of different types of music. And he talking about the Arf, Tal being the Arf Anteri, I mean Haidu was I think at this time it was it was met with a sort of a a sort of a certain amount of shock um that, that it sort of displayed a type of its oppositional character at the time in 1970 because of the way he portrayed the jewish elements versus the non-jewish elements meaning at this point the christian elements which might have been seen as maybe anti-semitic from from various diasporic periods and right. um and so anyway do you want to just say a few words before we listen to a little extract from the middle of that. Yeah, I, I want to say six. that I want to say that uh, um, in order to, to situate Haidu properly, we have to understand he was a different creature, so to speak. To begin with, he arrived in 66 with no debts to the uh, to to what we earlier what discussed earlier and uh, under the purview of Hebrew culture. He had no debts to this uh, um, to these cultural codes whatsoever. In fact, he suspected them more than anyone else because um, uh, for him, this whole notion of sanctifying the territory was uh, was um, 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 alien to, to, uh, to begin with. Uh, bear in mind in his uh, musical training, he was an ethnomusicologist, which means he was exposed to the, to the most raw ethnographic states and uh, he could he was one of the uh, single individuals who could evaluate the way uh, a certain ethnographic input travels uh, before it becomes uh, an artsy construct so this uh, so with this background in, in mind we need to understand first of all we need to study his music uh, from uh, paris and hungary to properly evaluate him uh, we cannot play this uh, this identity uh, um, uh, game where we assume that uh, from the moment he arrives in Israel, he becomes an Israeli composer, and I can see all those, um, you know, master thesis, uh, high do Israeli identity. It's not, it's never that simple because in his works from the 60s, you can see, you can find him improvising and doing the ethnography of the self. He, he both improvises and transcribes himself uh, in, in a way that no average composer can do. I mean the 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 accuracy and and the way he can freeze a certain improvisation means that uh, that on the one hand he takes a still shot of what he was doing on a certain day, and on the other hand he realizes that, that, that this is uh, that this version or variant is just a temporary uh, and and most likely misleading representation of of his music. 
So with this in mind, uh, he was he was deliberately pushing not just the ethnographic to the to the foreground, but but the, the this raw um, these raw states of matter of the ethnographic without distinguishing between uh, identities or nationalities, and that's why he he staged, so to speak, the adjacencies of Christianity and Judaism in the 12th century somewhere without committing himself to uh, any authenticity of any kind. He was just interested in, in, in putting those, uh, those ethnographic uh, modes together and see what he can learn about uh, the way the transition from one another uh, uh, throughout the course of the piece. So we're going to listen to which movement, which scene? I think it's the uh, where the, where they start singing and then the uh, the rabbi, as it were, the, the child, the, the Christian child who sort of mimics the rabbi. Right. Um, is uh, I'm just trying to. Um, it's the fifth yeah. scene, I think. Is it the fifth scene? Okay, so yeah. we we come in actually. Interestingly enough, um, this match is very much. I wonder if it's a sort of field recording that he's actually using here. Um, maybe you can, you know, um, of, of, did he make the record, is this a recording of an, a performance or is it actual? This is a recording feels... of the premiere of a premiere from, from January 1971. Right. Okay. So here we go. So this is the fifth scene. Um, and... So there is a lot to unpack here, um, starting with the fact that you uh, you started playing from the very end of the fourth scene, 
where, uh, where the Jews are reciting psalms against the background of a Christian boy who apparently not just know, not, is not just familiar with their, mu with their music, he also knows how to imitate it. Um, and it continues with, uh, with a mock, uh, a mock like, um, with, with a mock music that uh, at once imitates cantorial music. And this is completely anachronistic because uh, we can assume Jews have, uh, uh, hadn't sang like that. Uh, and this is something closer to the 18th or 19th century. But again, uh, Haydn was not uh, searching for authenticity. He, was, he wanted to show uh, not just uh, musical adjacencies of, of two completely, um, two, two different uh, ethnic groups that are perceived as, as, as the uh, uh, opposites of one another, but rather he wanted to show that musically speaking, they were not just very attentive, there was a dialectical transition, a mutual dialectical transition impacting both, both groups' music. So what we see in the process here is that uh, the Christian uh, children are mimicking uh, the, uh, the Jews and their music, and, and they are uh, taking, uh, they hear certain Hebrew words and they defile them by, 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 uh, by turning kadosh, right? Uh, sanctus into kaka, which I don't have to translate for you. Um, and this, this word play is actually something uh, kids would do, but Haida was actually drawing on those, um, um, on those texts from the 15th century where uh, Christians were abusing Hebrew words or using gibberish Hebrew or Hebrew, if you'd like. They were using Hebrew in order to uh, place uh, Jews as discordant people who, uh, who corrupted both language and music. And Haido takes that in order to, to create something that apparently annoyed not just the audiences, but also uh, music critics and, and even President Zalman Shazar at the time, and, um, and the editor of Yediot Achronot, who's one of the signatories of the Scroll of Independence, they all wrote um, furious articles the next day. And I can tell you, every composer today would, uh, would uh, wholeheartedly uh, uh, sign up for a scandal like this, because I cannot imagine anything uh, uh, garnering so much negative attention in the, in, in the press today. Um, so this was this was a gift because it brought the, the issue to to uh, daily newspapers and Haidu was able to say, I know exactly what happened to you, talking to Israeli audiences, the same audiences and critics who blamed him for being auto anti-Semitic and a masochist and so forth. He said, I know what happened to you. You've repressed the exilic to the point of, of falling in love with those stupid cadences heard by the Christian uh, children, you know, predominant going to dominant and going to tonic. Wow, amazing. But then when you discover that they are anti-Semitic, they are violent, that they're, the, manner they, the manner that they imitate the Jews led to violence, the, the, the moment you discover that, you had no alternative because uh, your first uh, response was to reject any manifestation of diasporic music, because that's how you were trained to, that's how you were indoctrinated to perceive anything that has no direct connection to the territorial. And the, the idea of diasporic cultures threatened the Zionist project. This is why in the Zionist grammar, we use the diaspora and the singular, although there are diasporas and various Jewish cultures and histories, but the very notion of, of Jewish histories and culture outside the national territory was a threat. So Haida was putting all that uh, uh, on stage and, and hitting a nerve. And he found his accusers guilty of repressing uh, uh, diasporic options, diasporic nationalism. And, uh, and uh, at the moment they, opted for Christian music, they realized it's still violent for them. And then they, they, they stayed, they were left without, without anything. And when they were left with, without a single other option, they blamed the composer. So uh, it's an was, amazing. Yeah, sorry. Um, so Haida was, was uh, bringing a different temporality that no composer before him had introduced. And he continued after two years to set the Mishnayot, as you said, to music. And this is probably the most boring legal uh, uh, a codex you could think of, uh, but 
and Zionism had no interest. I mean, uh, Hebrew culture had no interest in this legal codex at all. Um, again, it didn't lend itself to anything national, but Haida was bringing this different temporality to, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to art music, setting that in a way that complemented this, this legal codex with a, with, with a, uh, a very rich encyclopedic uh, um, sets of styles of music. He was composing with styles without being postmodern in the American uh, sense of the word. And these different temporalities were completely new to, uh, to, um, uh, to the discourse in Israeli art music. And of course, what's more, more, most important, they were non-territorial. Can you define this concept of territoriality? Because um, you talk about it in, the, in terms of the Zionist project in its early stages and everything, and then the idea that uh, it becomes not a, a it, 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 there's a sort of um, sort of release from the concern with territoriality, perhaps. Um, you know, um, is there's a there's a there's a quote actually of uh, Orgad, who says that the Hebrew language is a sort of common denominator to which he's linked, and it forms a sort of symbi symbolic territory. The Hebrew language is the territory. Right. And is, you know, he, he's slightly different from the literalist idea of borders. Um, you know, uh, to, when you're talking about territory, are you talking about the urban, the, the urban and the landscape and the, and the, 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 the way of the use of the the sonic the sonic um um you know middle eastern aspect actually i've just yes there's a the comment there that quite interestingly came up from agnes Corey touches on that there's a sort of hungarianism in there um, mm -hmm. because it does actually sound like a hungarian folk song um and you know there are still territorial elements to what he's doing. I mean, there's just that it's coming, as you say, from the diaspora. So you're talking about the territory of Israel as, yes. as, a, as a protective, as a cocoon or something. What is it? How, how can you define it? You know, by the 70s, the only people who read uh, the Bible in, in the literalist manner, it, it had been read in the 40s and 30s, were um, people uh, affiliated with Gush Emunim, those who were setting up settlements in the occupied territories. They were the torchbearers of, of the labor uh, movement, and they were the only um, uh, political faction promoting territorial expansionism. Now, if you, if you appropriate, a, a, again, in a literalist manner, without those post-biblical uh, exege exegesis, uh, um, if you uh, appropriate certain uh, text in order to uh, underscore uh, your ownership of the land, the return of the land, uh, of the land, uh, the return to the land, um, the um, um, the setting of biblical landscapes through holidays like uh, Tu Bishvat, right, which uh, uh, the reconstruction of biblical landscape through minor holidays like Tu Bishvat, which became national holidays, then. Uh, de your de facto promoting territorial nationalism, and that refers to the to the still uh, unfinalized borders of of, of Israel. But uh, by the seventies, the only group that was promoting nationalism were those settlers who were still continuing uh, to read the Bible in a literalist manner, under the purview of certain leaders like uh, uh, um, uh, Rav Cook uh, Jr. Um, but uh, their sense of messianism was not different from in its mechanism from the way theological tropes had been nationalized in Hebrew culture. But Haidu, so, Haidu yeah, is, is partly he was an immigrant. I mean, he he also came later, let's say, and sort of so did Kopitman and 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 Dorfman and people. Maybe did, did, they had a different um, uh, Earlier history, let's say their own their own compositional history, sort of had had you know he'd he'd absorbed his own territory there, um, the Hungarian right, folk song. But, uh, and, but so, as an ethnomusicologist, he suspected <laughs> all those all those formulations that were that served a function in in territorial in Israeli territorial nationalism. Because yeah, but what you're saying is that the territorialism it, it ceased to be the main preoccupation. 
of in, in the aesthetic outlook. This is what was what we're saying that there was no consensus of this is this is the important sort of topic of the day sort of thing. Uh, not that, that the territorialism was not actually still important. The territory was still there because, yeah. So in, in a way, were, hmm. the territory was still there. But even even Seto, who grew up, who was one of the first to come to Israel, he came in twenty six. Right before all those German composers fled from Germany and, and Central and Western Europe, he came in 26. Yes. Uh, even, even he, by 66, stopped using ethnographic imports in his music because he realized that that served the territorial function he no longer believed in, which means even those who grew up in the Ashuv were becoming disillusioned with this idea of territorialism. And that was 66, so you can't use uh, the six day war as an excuse. That was before that. And if you look at what Tal was doing in the late, in, in the mid fifties, he was doing pretty much the same thing uh, of, of uh, uh, using uh, various transcriptions by Edelson, but, by, but resituating them in a post tonal context so they wouldn't serve a territorial function. That was already in the fifties. So it doesn't happen, happen over a day. And of course it was easier for Haidu, both as an ethnographer and as an outsider to start writing music without being committed to this long history into which you just stepped in. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't know if there's, there's a room there for debate really in, in terms of what the aesthetic aims were of that generation. But I think we should do, do, what, do one further skip and just finish off on, and then open it up for discussion. I know we're sort of running very close to the mark here because we've we're, it's now 20 past six or 20 past whatever hour it is um and there's like you know 500 more pages to discuss in your book and uh and and fantastic you know lots and lots of ideas so i'm just thinking but it would be nice just to just round it off with this a little bit um, a couple of minutes of the last example because that takes us really quite close to present day i mean i don't know actually i'm just trying to think um <laughs> What the year was, um, 2000. Um, it's a piece you by mean, you mean Hosha Not Hosha Not by Bot Betty Oliveira. So we've had basically a bit setting of, of a biblical story from the book of prophets on, on the from the prophets. We've had a setting of let's say prayer, prayer liturgy in a, a sort of uh, it reminded me actually of uh, Judith uh, Frigeshi. Uh, who who is a wonderful uh, ethnog ethnomusicologist? You know, who's recorded the Hungarian, the sort of the sound of the synagogue. It, it, it felt very much I do sort of setting of that had that touch to it. Um, and then this is a completely different way of setting a prayer, which is actually recited every every so often. Uh, the Hoshanot, the, the prayer of supplication, and and uh, particularly on Sukkot, isn't it, with the taking round the the the, the love and whatever and yeah. and 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 you did a very close analysis of the of the way that the text is actually used here and right. and i if i remember rightly you point out that it's it's sung by a woman that okay that's not so diff odd for a concert aria or piece um but it is in in relation to the fact that it is actually a ritual from the sh from the synagogue and it is actually has that element of of ident well, i will use the word identity of the feminine of the gender sort of a tension between what what you expect in in the ritual and and the singer and anyway i think people will hear it in in this sort of extract um it's the beginning i was going to just play the first few seconds and then cut to the ending i don't like doing that but it's uh this piece it's just is from, one way of illustrating it this piece is from 2000 and was revised in 2003 just to give you the chronological coordinates Right. Do you want to say anything? And no, no. About go ahead. We, we talk about, talk it. about yeah. it. Talk about it later. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so I'm just uh, one second. I have to just um, find it. <laughs> Give me one sec. Right.
Right, so Powerful that was pieces the middle. <laughs> we think we left out the middle, which uh, which obviously there are some quiet moments. Let's say um, this actually uh, reminded me of another piece uh, by. Uh, the, the first thing I was thinking about it was Bert Whistle's Panic. You know, it was a piece that was played at the Proms. I think it was in in 2000, uh, 1995, possibly quite a long time ago now, with John Hall, the saxophonist. And it's it's it is full of a sort of screech and a sort of pleading sound high up in the saxophone, and it has this sort of. And I I thought this very wonderful. It's, it's sort of I know it's a bit shocking in some respects, but it's a sort of setting of the of the Hoshana of the of that in the pleading aspect of it is 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 really powerful and the angry chords toward at the end you know is is very very strong now i just have to say because i've had i've had a wonderful time on your on your youtube channel you know look at it snowingly and listening to other pieces by her and the naharot piece which comes afterwards which is a beautiful beautiful um lyrical type of uh, work compared let's say with this and has all sorts of in, uh, influences coming from monteverdi to sort of um arab bukharan music or, or other types of different different things coming into it in the collage completely different from this so i have to say that this is a sort of expressionist like um strong modernist work but you'll tell us that it's based on some you know autochthonous material um, or something. <laughs> since, they want, since, they want, since we want to open the floor for questions, I'll be very yeah. brief. Um, this is a wonderful example of a composer, a female composer, we should say, um, uh, who, whose work with the ethnographic is, is more attuned to the space, to, 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 the, uh, to, the, to this space here of the Middle East, maybe North Africa, the Near East and North Africa. So the the very the, the very notion of political borders is completely irrelevant for her work, um, and she is more occupied with uh, formations uh, of of musics that travel through this uh, space and acquire different forms as they move. So um, what she does, which is remarkable, is that she she always works with with those uh, ambiguous cluster. Um, the clusters and uh, and and with those uh, uh, clusters, she deliberately sabotages traditional directionality, uh, but nevertheless anchors them in in static tonal nods. And these nods, the way they uh, create movement, is that they undergo a process of tainting for the purpose of rebrightening. So. She might take a simple uh, triad and with lots of additives. And once she cleans out those additives from it, it creates a movement. And then she would, again, make it murky uh, as she goes. So what's remarkable at that, about that is not just the, that our, our ethnographic imports transcend the notion of nationalism and, and, the, and identity politics, is that she uses the very Western mechanism that disciplined the entire scene here. Right, the discipline, the entire no, the, the entire field of nationalism and music, the disciplined musicological historiography. She took the she, she takes this uh, uh, she takes these Western um, um, signifiers and and uh, she wounds them very deliberately. Uh, she sabotages them. She she stains them, and this is another meaning of stains. Uh, for this book, we talked about theological stains, but this is a this, these are actual stains uh, uh, um, um, inflicted upon uh, those very um, mechanisms that discipline the entire scene, both in uh, both the musicological scene and the musical scene, uh, at least in the early days of the Yeshuv and, and early years of statehood. Uh, and this was remarkable about her because when she brings those imports, they lack. Uh, the, you, you cannot distinguish. In Neharot, for example, you have uh, an electronic motet of various women lamenting, and you can't tell whether they're from Lebanon, Israel, uh, the Jewish Israel, the non-Jewish Israel, North Africa, or Iraq. And the truth of the matter is that they come from all over the place, but you can't distinguish between them because they belong to the same space, and they travel uh, in the same space. And that's far more interesting for, for, uh, for Olivero 
than pinning it down and claiming ownership of a certain ethnographic import. Add to that the fact that she stains or wounds those Western uh, mechanisms, together it becomes uh, a thing that uh, attests to this disillusionment with territorial nationalism we had talked earlier and, and, the, and the entire device of nationalizing theological tropes. Okay, so you've ra you raised the thing about the theological stains, and I wanted just to end with this question of like, you know, the, the, the notion of stain is quite a nice word because stain is something which actually, you know, you, you immediately think something is ruined when it gets stained. And, and on the other hand, stains can be removed, actually, some of them anyway. Um, so the question is, um, and also, I mean, in the theological stain, I wasn't quite, you know, you didn't, didn't quite go into the, the depth of what, in, in what sense that the, the theology is stained. I mean, or the, the, that, that it's, 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 it's brought into the discourse in, in a sort of way which, is, which, which, which gives it a, um, a particular orientation. I was just wondering about lots of other words that we have in our, in our um, terminology. Um, you have you know, reinterpretation, influence, um, hybrid, hybridity, um, possibly superimposition. Th those sort of things are sort of staining type of mechanisms. Aren't they? Right. They're, they're sort of. But... In, I, don't, I don't use influence. Uh, it's a too no. porous word. But right. I would say that things uh, attest to traces, and and traces. Uh, from these traces we build networks. And I can say that stain is not only negative. If you think of stained glass, this is the most uh, alleviated thing you can think of, right? And and we have birthmarks, which in Hebrew are called stains as well. Uh, so this is uh, okay. This is. Uh, uh, um, you know, this is uh, right. something that uh, right, this, uh, this, this is a very positive sense of uh, memory, or it's a positive aspect to begin with. So stains is is really uh, the uh, an excuse for me to say we have lots of traces here, and we should practice what Bruno Latour calls as sociology, sociology of association, right? And and if we work with these stains and and the these traces we can build those networks with which we can uh, resituate this music and not only as national which is why we titled this talk israeli art music as art music you don't want we don't want to be the other of 20th century music we're part and parcel of this history thank you so much okay so i think asaf with that uh, we can open it to the floor um and i don't know whether you know people want to unmute and uh, or put their um, hands up, as it were, um, and I will put some questions in. I know people have had to leave, uh, but there's still some people here, which is great. And um, and then we'll sort of, you know, afterwards we'll say our goodbyes. But I think we we we've got. Um, it's now it's actually it is a, it's now 35 past the hour, but um, I'm I'm still here. And we're and Asaf is still here, so we'll we'll just carry on. So, um, would anyone like to um, either raise hand or or um, or put a? I see Yahoash on my screen is would like to welcome. If you'd like to um, unmute somehow, it's not. It's still muted. Can maybe somebody help uh, from the? Laurie, I don't know whether Laurie's around. Yosh, we're not hearing you. You're on mute. Yeah. It's usually on the left-hand side. Yeah, that's it. You had it. You you just unmuted, and that's it. Do you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, it's getting late, and we lost about half of the audience. I have only two comments because, of course, I could say a lot, but we cannot start a new lecture now. Uh, first of all, I want to say it was only fair to mention if we, we talked about bibliography, my book, Music in the Jewish Community of Palestine, which was published by Oxford Press in 1995. And it was the first English book about the history of Israeli right. music. 
And second, uh, Asaf was right that I may get very angry when he calls Ben Chaim obsolete. I think it's not only annoying that it's totally wrong in any possible way, but I cannot really lecture about Ben Chaim now and prove why it is wrong. And Can you explain? Could you could you just say the word in English, Yahash? Uh, uh, you you so said it in Hebrew. Obsolete. Sorry? It's not Hebrew. Oh, obsolete. Obsolete. Sorry, obsolete. I see. Yeah. That, what uh, Asaf I don't know if he to be to be fair. I don't think Asaf said he was obsolete. What he said was that some to certain concern. What the, in the context of what he was saying, he was saying certain things that he was doing did not address some of the issues that were uh, that were relevant to. Some that was the obsoleteness was a sort of a qualified one. I mean, but I mean, I, I take the point that you want to d debate it, but I think what he was saying was this very sort of specific type of of, oh, of thing. But maybe let's let him let him defend it. <laughs> yeah, we cannot talk about it let, now. Well, well, Asaf can defend or, or can can. But, uh, it's really getting too late to yes. start. There, I mean, there as we said, there are going to be lots of um, of of debate debating point i was going to mention your book actually at the beginning but um you know um as it was actually to do with composers who then of course became part of the state i mean the title was pre was was in the yeshuv so that was the sort of different the, the difference there that that it wasn't you know a book on on the on the recent on it's also about composers but let's not continue with mm. I yeah. do want to say that the Yosh's book, uh, although it stops in 1948, uh, was a breakthrough in the field because he was situating this music socially using both uh, uh, the discourse in, uh, among critics. And, and he, I think he was one of the first to consult primary sources in, in length. And this was certainly a model for me when I was working on my first and second books. Um, by, absolutely. Thank you. Mm, mm. Um, Agnes, one sec. Golan, did you have your hand up? I can't, I can't see. Yes. 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 Say, so, Can Golan Gua. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, wonderful conversation. Um, question for Asaf. You mentioned at the end that Israeli art music is ultimately part of the system of 20th century art music. Now I was wondering, and now in your um, framework, the idea that music is um, represents or um, embody a kind of embodies a, a national identity plays a very important role, or the denial of national identity. And I was wondering, how do you think we might move beyond those concepts in discussing? Um, Israeli music, if we still, but we, when we are still interested, of course, in exploring it also in terms of of culture, of cultural history, and such critical frameworks. Well, uh, Malcolm uh, uh, and I talked about this. We had several talks before this uh, session, and I told him that there are some words I deliberately avoid uh, in my research. One of them is identity, and the other is representation. Okay. Um, identity is just too coarse, it's too general to begin with, it's too porous. And, and, um, um, and representation is just too binary. Now, if you want to, uh, let's take Tao's music, for example, right? This is an offshoot of what was happening. Uh, uh, it was part of the, of the alternatives that emerged and, and competed with, uh, with tonal music. And these post-tonal formulations he, would, he was working with cannot be dealt with only by means of negation compared with those tonal composers, uh, say, uh, Ben Chaim or Lavri. It's just too easy, and it creates just two groups opposing one another while being, in fact, uh, while having much more in common than, than, those, uh, com than those aesthetic devices that separate them, seemingly. So if you want to situate Ta properly, uh, um, you have to study his imports. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to study to study his habitat, and 
I, I think there was a sense of, of uh, separatism embedded in this rhetoric of negating the diaspora because there was here and there was there and, and we didn't deal with it with the transition or we, with the fact that the dialectics in, involved in composers arriving and being dislocated here and writing music that wasn't different from, from the ecosystem from which they uh, had arrived. So just by acknowledging that, think about composers whom you probably know, like Chaya Chernovin, right? Who got her, her musical uh, training here uh, in, in a particular post-ideological um, climate. And she becomes part of, uh, part of the avant-garde, part of the European avant-garde. And yet she, she keeps on coming to those uh, texts that disable a nationalization her very choice of Grossman's uh, See Under Love in her mm. first opera, Pnima, is a very annoying choice of a text that by itself, forget about the fact that she mused this text throughout the opera, right? Mm. Uh, this is another smart decision not to, uh, to avoid those pitfalls of the Holocaust, to avoid, by the way, the pitfalls of representation. But her very choice of this text uh, attests to the fact that she was aware that this is, this is something that... Um, that disabled the way Israel appropriated or nationalized the Holocaust. So once you do that, and once you get out and, and, and decipher her extended techniques and semiotics within the context of modern European music, within the context of contemporaneity, then it ceases to become uh, uh, Israeli in the bad sense of the word of, of being an essentialist adjective. That's the advantage. Mm -hmm. And that's how we can, we can, we as musicologists can compete on, on a ground that uh, doesn't suffer from this, uh, uh, from, from this sense of being subjected to everything that happened in Europe and we're just the periphery. I'm sorry, the periphery is what animates contemporary music right now and ha apparently has been animating contemporary music. We just have to stop apologizing in front of a canon who, who is, uh, that is constantly being destabilized by other musicologists, not just by us, so. Thank you, thank you very much. I know Agnes had a uh, oh, comment I... comment to make. Is that right? Can, can, yes. Can you hear me? You can hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, okay. All right. So um, apologies because I had to miss about almost 10 minutes of this evening because I had a very important call coming in. So in case I'm saying something which already was said, then apologies. And the other apology is that you are the expert on Israel music, so it's a bit of an arrogance, um, what I'm going to say now, but here you are. So you were discussing Haidu and nationalism and how he was doing things later than other composers, that it was no longer the sort of thing to do, like being nationalistic or that sort of thing. I just want to say that um, Haidu went to Israel for one reason, he didn't go there because he needed to save his life, like the, the Germans, you know, and Partosh and all those people. Um, he went there because he wanted to be Jewish. That was the sole purpose. I actually met him. And so I've got a little bit of personal recollection. Being Jewish and very, very, very Jewish was very important to him. And if I recall correctly, he had lots of children. I think when I met him, he might yes. have had about six. I'm yeah. not sure. So what I'm saying is that he took Judaism. That was his life. So it's just I'm thinking that when you discussing his when you discuss his music, it's worth bearing in mind that he was first and for, foremost a Jewish man, a Jewish composer, and only afterwards an Israeli composer. And I'm sorry if I'm talking rubbish, but that's what I feel after I met him. And thank you for your time. Thank you. I must say that by the 70s, when we talk about Haidu, neither Haidu nor I distinguish between Jewish and Israeli. In fact, uh, I talk about the uh, dialectical returns to diasporic Jewish cultures. And Haidu is one of the most important protagonists uh, um, of this, uh, in this uh, historic moment, which takes place more roughly in the 70s. So I don't think uh, 
I'm giving titles to composers, whether they're Jewish or Israeli or how Jewish or how Israeli they are. Uh, what's important about Ihaidu is that he brings those new temporalities um, to the fore and, and actually uh, shifting composers' attention to, uh, to the non-territorial options that Zionism had repressed uh, throughout uh, four or five decades. Um, that's his main contribution. I, I, I don't think it's useful to, to ask how Jewish or how Israeli he was, but he was certainly not, uh, he was not a fan of nationalism by any kind. When he talked about Zionism, for him, this was a Spartan project. These were his words in his autobiography, in his document. This was a Spartan project, which he, um, uh, which he very much rejected because he thought that the very notion of repressing the diaspora uh, is um, is problematic because you repress the ethnographic and for Heidel the ethnographic was the core was was this is where the truth was uh, uh, to be found so uh, this is the dissonance that he located in, in Zionism and he did everything in his compositional power to uh, uh, to um, reset this uh, this notion uh, can I perhaps come in just also to say something um I also, you know, uh, I did actually interview Haidu when he was here, and I was just actually looking over my transcript, I think probably bits that I didn't actually publish. And he was very interesting because he was doing some ex work with um, with a Yiddish, with a, with a singer at the time, and he was sort of working on Yiddish song. And he, he actually said something like, you know, but I don't just sort of arrange songs, you know, I look for what's really important to me in the song and 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 choose that you know what's the point otherwise you know um and i don't aim to just do what people want i mean his his idea was very clearly that um he, you know he um he wanted to do something different i mean he was very much on that on that wavelength i mean that's why he was his his projects were were so th um, interesting especially in in the last in the last years um but i was just wondering if Asaf, if you're taking just this um, individual, you know, it's it's true that, that we have to look at particular cases, the case histories, as we, as if you want. Um, but also, if you're if you're looking at the contiguities or the adjacencies or things, you know, somebody like Sippy Fleischer, who does, who to who draws in different influences, different texts, different periods, different communities, into her, into her style. I mean, it's it's sort of contiguous, I would say, to, to Haidu in some ways, which he also has this aleatoric um, sort of element, um, but totally different. I mean, it, it, the music is totally different on a different um, topic, let's say, but uh, it seems to me that there are some parallels and that there are some, you know, Haidu was unique, obviously, but but he was doing some things in a certain context of, of and, and I was just wondering whether, you know, you can see that uh, uh, horizontal um, you <laughs> see, um we earlier we talked about the different uh, parameters that make a certain composer what he is and and one of the uh major factors that distinguish one composer from the other is is his contact with with ethnographic materials now Haidu, of course was an ethnomusicologist he was working he was transcribing he was writing uh, um uh, ethnographical research on hasidic communities yeah. Uh, he was recording uh, a kollel, yeshivas uh, in uh, in Bnei Brak in there in uh, shortly after That's the right. Iraq. and this was this was one of the uh, one of these uh, ethnographic sources uh, through which he staged uh, the eight Jews reciting a, a, a Gamora nigun in, in heterophony. But mm. uh, as far as Sipis Fleischer is concerned, what she had done in the seventies was truly. Uh, was truly in that um, um, in line with this discourse of trying to find the the ethnographic and and those linear properties in order to um, uh, uh, offer other uh, other alternatives options to to the uh, to the imposition of the national narrative and its territorial corollaries, but um, by the 90s. Uh, I am sorry to say it, it had 
uh, it became extremely childish because she reverted to immediate symbolism. Uh, in her fifth symphony, for example, she just put together, literally, she put together um, you know, a pew team and, and liturgical imports of various, from various uh, ethnic communities, including Shalom Hanoch, who's a rock singer. Everything was just put together as if to say, this is Israel. Now, you, we might have put a microphone in the street and recorded buses and people talking while they're walking on their cell phones and eating falafel. Uh, it, 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 it had the equivalent compositional effort. So something happened to her and she reverted to immediate symbolism, symbolism in order to maybe communicate with, with wider audiences. I don't know. But uh, what happened but, in the 70s is certainly in line with, with, with uh, this turn to, to non-territorial uh, aesthetic uh, writing. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, as far as I know, I mean, it's in, the, in the more recent things, she did actually do field work. She recorded sort of children in an Arab village and she went to the Copts in Egypt and recorded stuff and she she you know I mean it, you call it uh this you see that's that's an that's an issue you know if you have a, a sort of an obviously recognizable marker but you know um so does uh, Maxwell Davis when he uses a bagpipe and it, does it necessarily it's not necessarily the marker that's the problem it's the rest it's the rest of the music if you want I mean yeah. the markers yeah. the it, it, the markers I I don't see the reason that markers in themselves can't aren't um, passable. You know, I mean, that's another debate. That's a sort of an aesthetic debate. I mean, no, if you uh, say everything, it... everything that alludes, everything that alludes to something in an obvious way is is somehow, um, it's a bit like. You know, but, she, but she was, you see, she was part of the discourse when she set Arabic to music. She were she was bringing another temporality, but that was not that was not territorial and was not wasn't even Jewish. It was part of the of this. Of this uh, uh, of this space of this cultural space, and it was very important. But in later years, again, she she reverted to this immediacy, uh, um, and to to be honest, it is less impressive than the things she had done in the seventies. Mm. Right. Anyway, well, still an interesting composer. Anyway, so um, yes, Alex, uh, Alex is Alex is there. Fire away. So thank you. First of all, thank you very much indeed, both of you, uh, Asav and um, Malcolm. Uh, I have a question which actually could be um, addressed to both of you, um, but of primarily to Asaf. Um, and it arises from what you were saying during the course of the presentation. Um, and that is to do with composers who usually write a great deal about themselves and about their music. Um, and my question is, to what extent or when uh, does one uh, accept what a composer says about him or herself and the music? And to what extent does one actually question what they say about themselves or about their music? Because there is sometimes, a, how shall I say, a dislocate between the two. And I would like to know what are the criteria that you would apply to saying, well, this composer said this and therefore it must be right, or this composer said that, and hang on, why, why should we accept it? Excellent question, Alex. Uh, René Char, the French poet, wrote once that the fruit is blind and it is the tree who sees. I must be the tree when I do research. I must be the tree because my outlook has to be bigger it has to factor in um, much more, uh, many more variables that the composer either doesn't see or doesn't care about, um, which is fine. He has a job, he has to write music. So um, I always question what, what any composer says or, or writes about himself. Or God, for example, left 16 autobiographical books. They range from thin booklets to fat books. And they are written in, they haven't been edited. So it's quite a pain to read, to read through them uh, because he could use an editor who would cut things in half at least. And he talks about himself and himself alone. And it's only natural, but to qualify what he says, I need the archive. I need, I need his cultural ecosystem to, to balance things because this mode of self-representation when the composer speaks about himself is awfully problematic. 
right? Uh, Tal damaged his reputation by, by saying that he was, he was, uh, um, um, uh, he was the infantry blow of, of, uh, of art music. And this, and this is something that you can find in every text about, about Tal. And I always wondered, why aren't you looking at the, at the scores? Look at what he what he had done when he was writing music. Look at his uh, look at his lectures, you know, unpublished lectures when he was thinking about uh, uh, constituent uh, terms like Jewish music, like Jewish ethnography, like nationalism. In in 1951, Tal said that that uh, everything that composers do when they uh, when they impose tonal frameworks on on ethnographic imports, he called that falsified acoustics. Um, um, see what he was doing in those years when he was importing music, for example, Yuda Sharetz, um, Yuda Sharetz uh, tunes into his into the second movement of his piano, 1949 piano sonata. Look what he was doing there. He was it was questioning the very idea of this import and its and its tonal framework. So, at the end of the day, composers are not uh, authors or poets; they are composers. So they. Everything has to be qualified through their through their scores, preferably if you can get some uh, sketchbooks um, from their ecosystem. And and the last thing I trust would be what the composer says about himself or writes about himself. So at the moment you start qualifying that, you get a very very thick network, in which the composer is active first as a composer and then as a person who um, has something to say in words about his ecosystem, but then his ecosystem is bigger and louder than him because he's just one uh, one actor within this network. So that's how, so there's no exact criteria, right? I can't give you uh, guidelines in, in, in uh, numeric uh, order, but, but I can say that this, this is how I work and I always listen to the archive and I always listen to uh, uh, prose works of, of people who were writing. When, he, when, I, was, when I was studying uh, Solet and Dor, I was looking at what authors and poets were doing with King Saul, treating him as a foil in the 50s and 60s, beyond what he had, uh, what he had been familiar with, because I wanted to understand the discourse, the cultural discourse. I hope well, that answers listen, I think I think we're coming right up to the to the end of, the, of that. So I, I just, I know yeah. Geraldine wants to say something, but I just yeah. wanted to say from myself to say thank you to everybody and I wanted to say thank you to Asaf for this really interesting challenge here. Um, I, I said it was going to be polemical uh, what, he, what, he, what, he, what he says and what he writes and uh, I think that's always a good thing and we've ruffled a few feathers <laughs> I think. Um, I, uh, I also want to you say know. Asaf you're in the middle of doing a third book and I think that's or in the beginning of doing a third book so I wish you uh, success with that. Is there any hints you can give us a very 30 second hint about what that's going to be about. It's probably going to, it's probably going to be titled After Hebrew Culture. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay. T titles seem to be the main, yeah, the, the, the enticing thing here. Anyway, I, I'd like to say thank you very much and, and let Geraldine um, round it off. But lo lovely right. to, to, thank you. Great to speak. It's been so thank refreshing to have a real conversation about Israeli music. There is so much, there's a hundred years of music nearly now, and nobody's been talking about it apart from, of course, Yehoash. I mustn't, I mustn't um, <laughs> leave that out. He, he has valiantly, almost on his own, been doing it. So now it's so good. And I'm so glad that Malcolm's had this chance to discuss with you, because what I didn't say at the beginning is for JMI, Malcolm set up the Israeli Music Forum. We really focused on Israeli music. We had South Bank days where we had five concerts of Israeli music. He, we, he ran a, a wonderful conference with composers and scholars talking about Israeli music. So Malcolm, it's lovely for you to come home with Asaf and to have this chat. And I hope that we will have more because I think that it's really important to talk about uh, Israeli music and discuss it in this way. So thank you so much. Again, I'm sorry that we stalled you last time when you were about to start. Thank you to everybody who stayed with us to the bitter end. And, um, you know, I always feel if there are a dozen people who want to talk about something, well, why not? You know, why shut it off? People who have to go, go. Okay. But... I'm, only reason I need to shut it off is I have another meeting that uses this room. <laughs> okay.
Okay, so uh, sorry, thank you, Paul. thank you, Mark, thank you, Laurie, thank you. for making this possible. And uh, you may now 